Dear colleagues, dear Jana, uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce the first keynote of this AI conference. Professor Jana Köhler, though she received her PhD from Saarland University during her work at DFKI back in the 90s. She then moved to uh, Freiburg, where she worked with uh, Bernhard Nebel, and she finally received her habilitation from Freiburg. The particular thing about Jana at that time is that back in 1998, I think, it was the case that she won an international planning competition. And after this uh, winning of the competition, she finally got an offer of a company, uh, Schindler, an elevator company, and she, she switched and she worked for some years for Schindler. At that time, this was really extraordinary special because it was a time when the companies were luring around the corners at AI conferences, trying to hire young researchers. And this was really outstanding at that time that a leading AI researcher got a position at a company like Schindler. Then after Schindler, Jana worked for some years, I think it was for nine years at IBM uh, Research in Zurich. She worked there as a researcher and a manager as well. And then she moved to hold a professorship in Luzerne. And since 2019, she holds a chair at the University of Saarland. And she's a director of algorithmic business and production at DFKI. And I very much uh, think that the talk today will be uh, in the connection of business and uh, theoretical AI as well. Jana, the display is yours. Yeah, dear Ulrich, um, thank you very much for the uh, very nice introduction. Um, I hope everybody can hear me. And uh, yeah, it's my real pleasure to be uh, with you, uh, even if it's only uh, in an online version, but I'm so happy that uh, Ute and colleagues made this uh, conference happen and uh, organized it in such a, such a good way. Um, I will share my slides and then actually begin the talk. Yeah, uh, Uli already said this, so I'm a mixed person, I can say, hybrid AI person doing um, industrial things and uh, also basic research. And actually this talk will be about um, exactly uh, these two worlds. And um, I will talk about another uh, successful um, application done in Switzerland. Uh, Uli mentioned already the elevators, they are still driven by AI search algorithms and are still a very successful um, commercial um, story. One of the very early ap applications, in fact. And as Uli already said, uh, the 90s were quite different from what we have today. Uh, the title of my talk is 10 to the power of 120 and beyond. And I want to uh, talk about, for me, the hidden side of the current AI success, namely the, the advancement of AI research and search algorithms, which is uh, not so much noticed by many people, but which is really also key in, in many applications that we see. Uh, when we look back, and I switch to the new uh, slide now, and I hope uh, that the update works. If not, uh, please let me know. Uh, this is a, a screenshot from uh, um, a journal from 1992, and maybe the older ones still remember this paper. This was really a historic milestone. Model checking has passed 10 to the power of 20 states. I can see this. I you cannot, you're can you, ah, your screen sharing wurde unterbrochen. I try again. Let's see. So. Here we go. Yeah, good. Thank you. This is good. So I will, for the next minutes, I will always say when I switch to the next slide, if something is not working, then please let me know immediately. Yeah, so this is by the, the famous per, uh, paper by Birch, uh, Clark, Macmillan, Dill, and Wang, 10 to the power of 20 states and beyond. So this was really a breakthrough, and the techniques that were developed uh, made this uh, possible those years. 
Now we are nearly 30 years later, and of course our success story uh, looks quite different. So here I put together a slide that shows um, the, the number of games that we can play in a certain game and the timeline and how we actually see the breakthroughs by AI um, search algorithm research. Of course, it's always uh, mixed with other techniques already in 1992, uh, Gary Tesauro uh, with the TD Gammon uh, game for backgammon used for example neural networks and we've seen in the last years very different techniques that have been integrated but search is always one of the the key techniques that made these breakthroughs possible and if you look back in history then you see that we had the early days of um, game research in the four between the 40s and 70s of the last century where the big uh, names in ai uh, were engaged and delivered uh, first really uh, fundamental algorithms that enabled uh, computers to play these games. Then, as already said, in the 90s, we've seen some real breakthroughs. Uh, the backgammon game was not so much noticed by the public, but it in fact introduced um, techniques that we see even in newer uh, systems uh, successfully further developed. But then in 96, Deep Blue and IBM, this really hit the press and for the very first time a computer could beat a world uh, champion in chess. And you already see here how much uh, the state or the search or the game size number of games were sometimes or very often similar also with the state space size that we have has really changed. And maybe to give an idea what is 10 to the power of 120 about? Uh, this is um, um, the, num the number of atoms in the universe, which is uh, 10 to the power of 80. And now we take each atom in the universe and we put inside this atom a half universe. And this makes 10 to the power of 120. So this is huge, but uh, we're, uh, of course we haven't stopped there. We've seen um, then not much visible happening in the 20 years between the mid 90s and uh, 2012, but then uh, Watson came. Of course, this is a slightly different problem with um, question answering and jeopardy, uh, but it triggered the, the current big renewed interest in AI that we see uh, um, today and that we have seen over the last years. And then of course, uh, another really big breakthrough was um, AlphaGo. And uh, you see that also industrial research played a very big um, role in these um, breakthroughs, but also um, academic researchers uh, made a lot of contributions. And one system that uh, really uh, gained a lot of attention was in 2017, the Libratus Poker game that was developed uh, at Carnegie Mellon University. Yeah, today we are at even larger search spaces and even more important, we are, are able to tackle imperfect information games where we don't have complete information about the situation of the game or the possibilities of our opponents. So this is wonderful uh, when we look at the history. So 70 years of continuous research have really uh, made all these successes possible. And of course, the question is, how can we best leverage the success in the real world? And now I moved on to the next slide and hope you can see it. And here I um, will talk about uh, three, um, uh, let's say, fundamental classes of optimization problems. I originally came out of AI planning. Uh, I liked planning algorithms a lot, but when I moved to the real world, I realized that we need optimal plans and that actually developing good optimal solutions and also defining what actually optimal or good means in the real world is a real challenge and is a very interesting problem. So my talk today will be on optimization. And I will talk about three types of optimization problems. One I will only touch upon very briefly now at this slide, but the other two I will tackle in more or less detail. So the first problem is an offline optimization problem. So we are at design time, for example, I will uh, talk uh, about the so-called cable tree wiring problem. This is a very complex uh, problem where I get um, a so-called uh, cable tree description and I want to compute 
uh, a control for a machine that produces this cable tree. So we formalized this domain and it was used this year at the MiniSync challenge uh, where constraint solvers uh, compete in an international competition. Then there is online optimization and Uli Fuboch mentioned already that in the 90s I, I moved uh, to Switzerland and worked for an elevator company and worked on elevator control and uh, in those years we made it possible for so-called destination control systems to achieve their market breakthrough. Um, and uh, many of these systems have been developed by AI companies in the meanwhile, and they all use all kinds of AI algorithms. Now the industry is considering uh, even more advanced systems. And of course, in elevator control, we have a typical instance of an online optimization problem. So we constantly have changing situations, passengers come and go, the elevator cabins are moving, and we need to find an optimal um, schedule and plan how uh, the cabins, for example, in an elevator system are moving. And so far, this has only been a single cabin in one shaft. But as you can see here on this picture, uh, the companies are thinking about uh, several autonomous cabins moving in, in a much more exciting system of vertical and horizontal uh, pathways. Uh, many of these um, Ideas are at the level of design studies. A lot of patents are fired. Some people start working on first technical solutions. Uh, Tyson, for example, is very much at the forefront uh, with its twin system. But of course, in this general design, how we see the system here in this picture, they don't exist yet. And one question is, uh, what kind of transportation capacity can we reach here? If we can be at least as five times um, as performant as current systems, then this becomes economically interesting. And this is a nice playground also for students. And I've been working on this first with um, the Schindler company uh, for some time, but then they stopped, uh, unfortunately, uh, the project and uh, decided to not follow actively in this area anymore. But now I use this as a playground with students. So this is online optimization because we have to recompute an optimal reaction of the system to various control stimuli. And then finally in this talk at the end, I will go into something that I uh, call big data optimization. So here at Saarland University, uh, I've been in contact with, with Professor Jörn Walter. He is one of the leading researchers in epigenetics. And I want to introduce this problem to you because it's quite different than other optimization problems I've seen so far. And I think it has a lot of interesting research uh, challenges for us that we can address. Okay, let's move on. And um, let's look into optimization problems. Uh, today, we have actually quite uh, a number of options how we can uh, tackle optimization problems in AI. We have, of course, constraint programming. Uh, when constrained languages have evolved uh, to an enormous degree of expressivity, the solvers are extremely powerful. And once we have a constraint model described, we can actually compute uh, optimal solutions. Uh, here we are facing the modeling challenge. We need to describe our uh, problem and tell the computer what we would like to see as a solution. Recently, people start to, to look uh, into optimization problems using reinforcement learning. We see also here very uh, interesting success stories, in particular for robot control and also again in the games uh, domain. But uh, the industrial applications actually have a lot of additional challenges. Already in games, it was observed that some domains are so-called hard exploration domains. So hard exploration domains are domains that have many dead end states. And this is for a reinforcement learner uh, a real challenge. So this is really unfortunate because the, the set of actions during uh, the exploration becomes empty. The system ends in a dead end state and there is not much to learn. And, then, uh, and for example, the domain uh, of cable tree wiring is one of, um, or one example of such a hard exploration domain. And I will talk a, bit, a little bit about this in this talk. Then of course we can use neural networks, deep learning. Uh, many different types of networks are, have 
currently being tried on optimization problems. Uh, it can work, but it, it's also not easy. Uh, and in particular, here we have the training data challenge. And there are many and interesting industrial cases where we actually had, don't have enough data to go uh, this um, route. And of course, finally, we can um, develop application-specific algorithms. For example, the elevator control in the 90s was a very uh, highly tuned specific um, algorithm. And here we, of course, are facing the development and maintenance challenge. And I think, therefore, the first three approaches are the more interesting one that uh, we have offered. And of course, today I want to talk mostly about constraint programming. Um, let me briefly introduce this, uh, the constraint satisfaction and optimization problem uh, for those who have uh, not been working in this field. In constraint uh, satisfaction or constraint programming, we define a number of variables. Each uh, variable has a predefined domain of possible values, and we describe boundary conditions that limit the freedom how we assign values to the variables. And uh, when we solve a constraint satisfaction uh, problem, we want to find an assignment of values from the predefined domains to the set of variables such that all boundary conditions that we have formulated as constraint are satisfied. And uh, this gives us valid solutions. But if we want to uh, solve a constraint optimization problem, we in addition in in addition, describe um, a cost function, and we are looking for a solution of minimal costs. For example, below you see a very uh, classic example of a constraint uh, satisfaction problem. We have a graph given, and when we want to uh, assign colors to the nodes in the graph, such that two connected uh, nodes don't have the same color. And once we have found such a assignment, then we have a valid solution and the corresponding optimization problem would ask us to use as few colors as possible. So let me move on to the um, next slide. Let's slightly resize the slides. You should see slide seven now. Let me talk a little bit about optimization and stochastic search. Uh, for constraint optimization to work, we need uh, expressive languages. We need to model domains and we need to be able to describe objective functions. Furthermore, we need to develop the corresponding algorithms and we need to be able to uh, give uh, certain guarantees on the solution quality and also give bounds, for example, on suboptimal uh, solutions. This is all possible today. When we look at the more applied research questions, then there are, for example, questions such as how can we support modeling? How can we uh, support, for example, the process of selecting the right uh, constraint solver and how we can we configure it? Then how do we manage the data pipeline and how do we keep it going over the, the years? And also how do we address risks that might come with certain applications? Um, so far, um, the ILOC, CPLEX constraints uh, solver is for, in my eyes, the best commercial uh, CSP solver it today belongs to IBM, but it is uh, definitely um, a European success story. Many people already uh, or still remember the ILOC team that published regularly, for example, at the uh, European AI conference, and uh, the people are still uh, active in the uh, industrial development team. Uh, of course, apart from the constraint solver, um, ILOC also offers uh, powerful linear program and mixed integer programming solvers. Recently, Google entered the space and uh, came up uh, with, um, uh, let's say, problem class specific algorithms, but a few years ago with a CPSAT solver. So constraint solver that integrates also the, uh, successful techniques from uh, set uh, satisfiability solvers, such as close learning. And today, all powerful constraint solvers are in fact uh, leveraging and integrating various search techniques that AI has um, developed over the years. 
And for example, closed learning is one form of learning that these systems also use to address um, or to solve problems. And of course, um, the solvers usually use stochastic search. They offer different search strategies, but of course, uh, stochastic search is the most powerful that we have available today. Um, the solvers, in fact, get commercialized. So it's interesting that not only Google and IBM are active, but also Microsoft uh, is um, active in the space using the set three or developing the set three solver that can also be used for verification purposes. Uh, this is a summary of the Mini Things Challenge 2020 that you can see here on um, slide eight. Um, unfortunately, only Google is competing. IBM is not participating, but you can actually see how strong the solver is in, in along various categories. And um, I'll also show you uh, some more examples of these other solvers in a minute. Let me talk about um, the cable tree application problem. Um, I have worked on this for several years in Switzerland together with a company that, uh, with the name uh, Comax. Comax is a vendor of uh, cable processing machines. And here's an illustration of cable trees and cars. Uh, so for example, a Golf 7 has 14 cable trees with total 1,633 cables and uh, about 1 million cars per year is manufactured. And you can imagine what large quantities of cable trees we need. Uh, many cable trees are manufactured by hand. In fact, only 2% are manufactured on machines. So there's a huge potent potential to automate this manufacturing and it's also necessary because cables uh, contribute significantly to the weight of a car. And uh, today we can only automatically manufacture them in large uh, batch sizes. So this means that many cars contain cables that they never use. For example, if I order a car and I don't want a seat heating, then the connections might still be there, but uh, they are not active. So there's a big interest in the industry to really uh, tailor cable trees to uh, the needs of individual products and be able to uh, actually manufacture small uh, batch sizes and do this in an automatic way. So this problem consists of um, actually various sub-problems. The first is the description of the cable trees. You see here on slide 10 in the upper picture, you see an example cable tree. The German automobile um, Industry Association works on a standard, so called the so-called uh, vehicle electric container that would not only describe cable trees, but the entire electric system in a car in a standardized way. But in reality today, uh, everybody uses their own description. So, and this is mostly contained in Excel sheets. So this is of course then difficult if we want to uh, transmit cable tree to the trans uh, descriptions from suppliers to uh, car manufacturers and so on. So, but here uh, you see that actually standardizing data formats and making it easier to exchange data is a prerequisite also for successful AI applications. Then in this particular machine that we um, are using here to uh, product or produce a cable tree, we have to first place uh, the harnesses of the cable tree on a pallet. They're, they're fixated. And then a robot arms and comes and plug in the cables. And um, I will only talk about the permutation problem today. So we assume a given layout and then we are looking for sequential ordering of plugging steps. In this uh, uh, solution that we have developed, we've also solved the layout problem, where we produce actually a layout with another optimization problem that allows us to find then uh, fast uh, wiring orders or plugging step orders to manufacture the, the cable trees. Uh, I don't want to show a video today because uh, transmitting videos via video conference is not so easy. In case you're interested, you could, for example, click on this link and then uh, look on YouTube on such a machine. Here's a picture. And you see actually two people with whom we worked very intensively to, um, to uh, develop the solution. And you also can read here my most uh, yeah, let's say, uh, preferred quote about modeling, all models are wrong, but some are useful. So when we look at this domain, it's actually very, very intimidating. 
Uh, the agent is a single agent, so we have a single robot arm that comes uh, from the background of this picture, moves forward, and then actually plugs in the cable. But the actions can be non-deterministic. Yeah? The machine uses highly sophisticated sensors, laser cameras, everything, and very precise uh, movements, but it could still be happen that something goes wrong. And this is also related to the environment, because the environment is essentially the chaos of cables that uh, emerges when more and more cables get plugged. So the cables move. This is a dynamic domain. It's in fact a continuous domain. So we have uh, here some uh, complex physics of these cables. We can only partially observe this and we actually have uh, very few data. So when I saw this first and I thought, oh, this will be very difficult. What can we actually do here? Because if we want to use a constraint programming uh, approach, then we need to actually develop a discrete model. So let's look at this uh, model. So every job in such a cable tree uh, comprises one cable and uh, cable end that we need to insert into a so-called cavity, an opening in a harness. A cable consists of a job pair, so it has two ends, and usually both ends need to be plugged into these uh, cavities. Uh, in a cable tree, we have uh, B uh, job pairs, but we may also have so-called one-sided cables, so cables where only one end needs to be plugged. In any case, we have uh, what we are looking for, uh, for permutation of lengths K, uh, which is 2B plus N, where each uh, uh, position in this, uh, in this permutation gives us the position of a particular job. So we want to know in which sequence we actually wire the cables. And you see here an abstracted schematic picture of a wiring plan. This is a real world cable tree from uh, a German car manufacturer, but the cables in fact are much longer. So this shows you the connections, but it does not show you how the cables might fall on the machine. And also on the machine, they are not fixed, they are moving around. Yeah. But now with this um, formalization of the problem, we actually fall into a class of form, uh, permutation problems that is often used for routing, scheduling, or assignment problems. Let's look at the search space size. Uh, cable trees that can be manufactured on these machines usually have between 40 and 80 cables. And this leads us to the search space size of 10 to the power of 120 uh, up to the power of uh, 10 to 280. And here you see the numbers written out uh, just to give us an impression how, how large uh, the, the, the space is. This is the, the set of potential as the Let's say uh, it's the length of the permutation and it's the number of possible uh, permutations. So not all permutation sequences are valid because some of them might violate constraints. And of course, among the valid ones, there might only be a few optimal ones. So let's um, look at some uh, examples. So here you see again pictures, you see a real world cable tree on the left, and you see one of the uh, artificial examples that we created while we were uh, developing this solution. And uh, when you look um, at videos, then you can always see that all these cables are moving while the robot arm is moving left to right to actually pick up a new cable end and plug it into a, ca uh, a cavity on the pallet. So what can we do? So we looked at this, we actually um, developed um, a model of the physical behavior of, this, of these cables that is described with differential equations. And then we uh, for, uh, computed from these differential equations uh, that we actually really compute in this tool, we compute uh, constraints, precedence constraints that specify uh, con uh, conditions on the possible ordering of uh, wiring steps. Uh, we also implemented uh, algorithms from computer graphics to actually work very, very efficiently with these uh, differential equations. But then we uh, move to uh, these, uh, this constraint set and then we actually throw it all away. And it's only this di these discrete constraints that go into uh, the solver. So we uh, were able to describe uh, the problem with three different types of constraints. We have atomic precedence constraints, which can occur in a soft and a hard form. So we can say, for example, plug 
uh, cavity X before cavity Y, we can have these uh, constraints uh, joined in a disjunction. They occur in a specific form here uh, that is uh, also shown on the slide. And then we also have direct successor constraints. So the machine can interrupt uh, the plugging of one cable, put the other end in storage and pick up another cable. But some cables are too short for storage. So once we've decided to plug this cable, we need to plug uh, immediately the other end. So this makes a direct successor constraint that says if you have plugged um, cavity CI, then you need to actually plug the other end CJ. Um, let's look at an example. We have here given three cables, A, B, and C. A and B are two-sided cables. We have the job pairs C1, C3, and C2, C4. And C is a one-sided cable defining the job uh, C5. So in this instance has parameters K, K uh, equals five and B equals two. And here you see a number of constraints that it might come with. We have uh, five faculty possible uh, permutations, 120 possibilities, but only eight are valid solutions satisfying all the constraints. One example is shown on the slide. Optimization. Of course, uh, we not only want um, valid solutions that can be manufactured on the machine and that are robust enough, but we also want to have optimal uh, uh, solutions. And uh, for example, storing cables uh, costs time. So we want to be as fast as possible. So uh, minimizing actually the number of interrupted job pairs. So the number of times the machine uh, actually accesses the storage is a good idea. You see here weighted sum that we used and it delivers very good results. In the real product, we even have another criterion that really minimizes directly the production time. And for example, in, the, in this little example that we looked at on the previous slide, we have um, this one solution and this has cost 161. This is in fact one of the two optimal solutions that this instance has. So this is a small instance, but of course there are many uh, as a normal instance is much larger. Let's talk about uh, the theoretical properties of this problem. So when we look at this wiring and visiting the various uh, cavities on this palette, then it remains, uh, immediately reminds us of a traveling salesman person problem. And in fact, we have here a variant of a TSP with disjunctive precedence constraints and tour dependent edge costs. Uh, it's also a variant of the pickup and delivery TSP, but it's a little bit a strange variant. We can actually exchange pickup and delivery. We have to visit both, but the order doesn't matter. But we should not interrupt uh, the visit. And it's also a variant of the coupled task scheduling problem. We have proven that it is NP hard as soon as we have soft um, atomic constraints. And uh, we also shown that uh, if we hold only one-sided cables and only hard atomic constraints, then we can solve it in linear time. But we believe that, for example, um, that the problem is very uh, immediately uh, solvable if we have binary cables or two-sided cables and hard atomic constraints. But we were not able to prove this. Uh, this is the benchmark set on slide 19 that we submitted to um, the um, MiniZing challenge. 278 instances, 205 come from the real world, 73 are artificial, and also 22 unsatisfiable instances. Permutation length ranges from zero, where in fact uh, no cables have to be wired, to 198. And we have instances that have up to 10,000 atomic constraints and over 1,000 disjunctive constraints. Uh, we have uh, identified a so-called challenge set of 10 instances. And you see here uh, the parameters uh, that, uh, these, um, that we use to describe these instances. And we also have parameters that actually allow us to predict the difficulty. And I would say a few words about this next. Yeah, the modeling challenge, I think, let me say something about this in general. So um, 
the representation of the input data in the domain model is very difficult already. Yeah, there is not much in the scientific literature how we can do this. There are techniques such as using a dual model, for example, that we did here. But how you will decide on what, how you represent your domain is uh, very much up to the individual skills of a modeling person. Uh, decision variables definitions are tricky as well and also constraints. Yeah, we have to uh, formulate all the domain specific constraints but we also need to add symmetry breaking constraint, redundant constraints sometimes to help the solvers to scale. In any case even today solver performance depends significantly on modeling and there is a huge effort for manual testing and comparison the modeling variants where we don't have much support in the tools. And there is, of course, a relevant programming effort to validate solutions, uh, to make sure that this, the model is really correct. Uh, we need to, for example, have simulation tools and uh, validation software that, that really checks that all constraints are satisfied. Um, language syntax also matters. Modeling languages can look very differently. I show you here three examples. My personal favorite is uh, the CPLEX language. It's very compact and very readable and we need to have very good languages because we need to discuss the models with domain experts. Uh, you see in the middle the mini-sync variant, similar to OPL, but uh, a little longer and if you have larger models, I find the models actually harder to read. And then finally, the Google API, Google supports MiniSync, but otherwise it solves um, or offers APIs and this actually then becomes pretty cryptic. So implementing models in Google is not really straightforward. They have certain limitations. So for example, instead of having a direct uh, comparison on an integer variable, we need to have some rewriting to use additional Boolean variables. Uh, we benchmark the various solvers on this domain, C, uh, CPSAT solvers, so CPLEX, um, Google OR tool, CPSAT solver, but also the Chuft solver, which is one of the powerful academic uh, tools. We compared this with MIP solvers and with OMT solvers to see how um, other classes of algorithms uh, perform on this domain. And there is a paper currently under review that documents uh, the domain and uh, the challenge set. Uh, the first challenge that you actually meet is uh, that you need to map the solver states. Yeah? All solvers come with their own states. We distinguished optimal, suboptimal, and um, unsatisfiable and unsolved, plus an additional state undefined, and we first had to create this mapping. Then we had to set a time limit, so we ran a lot of examples on the challenge set to find out what a good time limit is. In the, in the end, we decided for five minutes because um, we find uh, suboptimal solutions with CPLEX in five minutes for um, all instances. Google finds some instances. It can solve in five minutes uh, one smaller instance. For the others, it's needs much longer. And the other solvers only solve a few instances. Of course, giving the tools more time makes sense, but uh, it's not so significant that we actually need to do this. And running our experiments or one set of experiments took over a day on a large machine. The next big challenge is seen on slide uh, 25, the tool chain. I don't want to go into detail, but when you actually want to reuse the models across uh, various tools, you have to do a lot of manual rewriting and you have to write code to actually transform the data. So here we can uh, could uh, do much more by unifying the interfaces, for example. This is the tool chains for solvers that separate data and uh, models. Other, on slide uh, 26, integrate data and models, for example, SAT3 or the Google CPSAT solver or OptimaSAT use uh, other formats where we had to use various converters, very dependent on uh, versions of the tools. You need to write your own Python scripts and so on. All this is available on uh, GitLab uh, and in described in the paper, but it's actually quite painful. So I actually thought we would never finish. So it was so complicated. One short summary of the results. The constraint solvers really uh, excel in this domain. So we see that Google and uh, 
CPLEX are very, very strong. They solve most of the instances. Only very few are not uh, solved. Uh, we have also instances that at end up in undefined states. So we had, for example, these two instances where in one instance, the initial state is equals the goal state. So the solution is the empty performance. And in another instance, we only have one single one-sided cable. And this actually uh, made some solver struggle. Um, when we look at runtime and cost comparisons, I only want to mention here one number. You see actually here, uh, if you take the same set that uh, the solvers all solve, you see that actually Google and IBM are much faster than, for example, the Chaffet solver. And you can also, in fact, see that for those that uh, uh, when they uh, find optimal solutions, then Google is even faster. And um, the costs of, um, let's say, the suboptimal solutions, actually this is the upper part here, is much better also that uh, found in these industrial solvers. Yeah. Uh, you can tune the model solvers further to improve uh, their scalability. This is possible, makes it a little bit better, but it's uh, not making such a big difference. Let's look uh, just briefly at MIP solvers. They solve much fewer instances uh, where we actually also tried this on different modeling variants. And when we compare this with OMT solvers, then there are even more instances that are not solved. I think OMT solvers are very, very interesting, but we also see that they are younger and they are not yet scaling so well. So let me at the end say a little bit about hard and easy instances. So during uh, the development of the solution and uh, modeling of all these problems and creating the benchmark set, we actually looked at, for ways to predict hard and easy instances. And we came up with one parameter that we called the constraint sum parameter that actually counts the number of constraints and which is uh, very, Mm, informative to assess the hardness of an instance. Of course, here we need much more data to confirm this, and currently we are looking also for phase transitions in this domain. So you can see uh, ranges of this parameter, how these solvers scale. And for example, you see actually optimal solutions are found in instances of this size, across the solvers and you see, for example, Optima set has a much smaller range here compared to, for example, the tuned Google solver. Suboptimal solutions are found for even larger uh, parameter sizes and only very few instances remain um, unle um, unsolved. So Google, in fact, only, there's only the largest instance that it cannot solve. IBM finds solutions for everything. Good, let me come to an end and let me, um, introduce you um, to you big data optimization, epigenetics. So uh, we, in, over the years, uh, we have deciphered the DNA, and uh, this also helps us a lot actually in, in the current uh, corona pandemic that we know more about this. But we, uh, researchers have also realized that the DNA code is not everything. So in fact, at the DNA, so the DNA is like wrapped around these histones and these histones have so-called tails. And on these tails, we have a so-called methyl group. And this is a, the uh, so-called epigenetic factor. And the methylation of the DNA seems to play uh, a very big role uh, in, for us, in our, let's say, how healthy we are, what type of diseases we develop, and so on. So recently, an ATH researcher brought out a book so we can control our genes. Um, and uh, it, as we know already, so for example, um, nutrition influences the methylation. So met the methylation is just a simple chemical structure that we can, in fact, influence. And then via this, we can, for example, then influence um, what happens to the DNA. Uh, of course, not everything is proven there. There are a lot of open research questions. And here's actually one uh, optimization problem. So researchers sample a mixture of various cell types, and then they contain uh, certain information. 
uh, about the methylation, but we, they would like to have the methylation profiles of the individual cell types, and they would also like to determine the distribution of the cell types within the sample. And we can actually compute this uh, by an error minimizing matrix factorization. So this gives rise to an optimization problem. And all you need to write down, in fact, is what you see here in the gray box. We have our uh, error minimization function, and we have three constraints that we need to satisfy. But the challenge here is in the big data. The matrices are huge. So this matrix uh, is, for example, containing nearly one million rows and uh, 30 columns. And of course, you can imagine current solvers don't um, easily read this in. So here we have still a lot of things to do to support, for example, researchers in solving their problems. Yeah, what are the research challenges that um, I see? Um, from the practical work, I think everything that helps to simplify the benchmarking of solvers would be great. Standardized interfaces are the right uh, thing to do. We need to pay a little bit more uh, attention to the data pipeline. It's very difficult to manage and we can actually do uh, uh, some, some more support here. It would be good to have more algorithmic support for modeling. For example, learning useful redundant and other constraints. Usually we have to develop a simulation environment to test and to validate the models and to debug them. And I'm currently uh, exploring how we could use th these environments, for example, for reinforcement learning to improve the models. Undefined solver states are a big issue. I, uh, didn't go into detail into this. Uh, on some instances, we can see remarkable deviations on very, very few. If we have a solver deviation on every instance, then we know that the models are not equivalent. But we have actually deviations on very few instances in the states and in the solution costs. And this is interesting and it's very hard to pin this down. And of course, it's interesting also for practical applications, but also for research purpose to recognize hard instances or phase transitions in certain domains, and then to develop techniques on how to further uh, deal with these hard instances. So with this, I want to end my talk and I thank you very much for your attention.